I was a person who would always represent myself as my opinion is better than yours. The commanding one who would decide what sport the class would play at PE, what movie the cousins would watch, what food the birthday boy would order at his own birthday party, and so on. This self-assumed leadership role began to make me feel superior. This superiority led to arrogance, and that arrogance led to anger, and anger that could harness negativity through any and everything. It continued until the third week of lockdown when I attend, attempted to Zoom bomb a biology class with a pseudonym just to make my friends laugh. However, before I even began, one of my friends screamed, repeat, leave, we know it's you. And that was in front of the teachers. So I was shocked. And I don't know what to do. And then the WhatsApp messages began to pour in. And Zoom bombing was a big thing back then. It was just the third week of lockdown. And then I began to portray myself as a victim of false accusations. I felt isolated because I was lying to even my closest of friends about it. At night, while I pondered upon the issue, I asked myself a question. Who was to blame? Who was to blame? And at that moment, yes, me, yes. <laughs> and at that moment, my body began to release this reservoir of guilt. That same moment, I opened the notes application on my phone and began writing my flaws one by one. The list grew longer and longer. But the main issue was my arrogance. And then the realization had been sparked, but there was a lot of effort to come. And so I, an immature 14 year old, began to strive for a higher moral compass. I became the one who could find the positivity between the negativity that COVID struck the world with. I became the one who could say that the lockdown was a blessing in disguise. How I many of you all think that's an unpopular opinion? Yeah, exactly, that's what I'm saying. And guess what? This improved moral compass made me do something I'm sure none of you here must have done. I wrote all my online tests with complete honesty. <laughs> okay, with a show of hands, how many of you believe me? Okay, I can't do anything to make you guys believe it now. Anyways, and that leads to my topic of today, decoding the issues faced by the youth. That's one of them. So I'm pretty sure at some point of time in our lives, we've struggled with the word there. Wait, is it T-H-E-I-R or is it T-H-E-R-E? -E? And that is an example of a thinking error. A thinking error is when it's, it's repetitive in nature. It's, it may sound like a mistake. However, a mistake is done just once. And with thinking errors, we usually don't know when we are incorrect. And that's why we keep repeating it. And we, as the youth, are more prone to thinking errors. Today, I'm going to shed light upon two particular thinking errors which are very relevant to the youth of today. Number one, the victim stance. This is where we portray ourselves the victims of anyone that questions us. For example, let's say you were out partying until 2 a.m. You returned home back at 3 a.m. You were supposed to be back at 12 a.m. And when your parents questioned you, you conveniently blamed it upon the Uber driver who dropped you home late. The it wasn't, I can see your faces. The it wasn't my fault of our lives that we used to dish out our accountability to other sources. Just 
to avoid any consequences. And it becomes repetitive, it becomes a habit until we begin to blame ourselves and make ourselves the victim of any and every situation. That was point number one. Number two, moving on, this is a point that has personally affected me in my life as well, which is I am different. The drive to be unique, to stand out from the crowd. It could be our fashion sense, the way we put ourselves on social media, the language we use, anything. And it leads to the I am right. I am right makes us develop a know-it-all stance, an overconfidence. Like, and that's the reason most of the youth always want to win an argument. Let be with your teachers, friends, and especially your parents. It was Mark Twain who once said, when I was 14, my father was so ignorant, I could hardly stand to have him around. When I got to be 21, I was astonished as to, as to how much he learned in seven years. So you see, you see, you see the change. And, and that leads to my second part of the point, which is the greatest of these influences comes from the friends that surround us. For example, over 70% of kids 13 and above suddenly develop an interest in sneakers, like the, the Jordans and the Yeezys. <laughs> so, exactly. Like, and, and I'm not saying it's wrong, but I'm just trying to show you how strong of an influence society can be upon us. And the dark side of it is that at some point of time in our lives, these could hit us in the form of social anxieties and addictions. For example, it's sad to foresee the fact that so many students here could end up with an addiction like vaping, which is very common with today's youth. And it, it really is a struggle. And scientifically speaking, Neurologists have discovered that the reason the youth faces such issues is because a part of the brain, the cortex, is developing. And so combined with hormonal changes and societal influences, the youth goes through a process called sensation seeking. And the reason we fall the trap is because we try to find happiness in while exploring new industries, new attitudes, new people, and surroundings. A lot of problems relevant to the youth. Let's move on to how do we solve it? Because that's the main part in the end of the day. So, number one, I don't want to get too preachy about it. Number one, what are the thinking errors I am making? Ask yourself that question. What are the thinking errors I am making? And believe me, the only hard part is the realization. After that, it gets easier because we, the youth, when we know something is wrong, we have that internal motivation to correct it. For example, for me, my personal growth transpired during the deadliest phase of the pandemic at a time when my mother was battling for her life due to various health conditions. My mother always gave me this one advice. And that was the catalyst to my change. She told me, repeat, make sure you have the right group of friends surrounding you. Because believe me, one of the biggest assets one of the biggest tools the youth has is our friends. And while they have the power to demotivate and deviate us, they do have the power to inspire and motivate us. We, the youth force, have and will be going through many global 
catastrophes. But we must brace ourselves and decode the issues we face with ingenuity, integrity, and responsibility. I am Rabit Rihan, and this is TEDx Youth at DGPS.